Good evening, ladies and gentlemen in Brazil. Good morning to our colleagues here in Australia. Welcome to the Australia Brazil Alumni Leadership Conference, co hosted by the Embassy of, Brazil, of Australia in Brazil and the Australian National University. Thank you for joining us today. And it's also good to see some familiar names of people who also attended our session yesterday. Um, even though we are meeting virtually ac uh, across the globe, I would like to begin our session with an acknowledgement of country because we do acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and pay our respects to elders past and present. Este ano, a Embaixada da Austrália no Brasil está apresentando uma série de webinars em parceria com a Australian National University, que é a universidade número um do país, de acordo com o ranking QS. Essa semana e semana que vem, a ANU traz especialistas renomados mundialmente para apresentações que vão apoiar o seu desenvolvimento profissional. Certo? O meu nome é Ana Paula, and like you, I'm part of the Brazilian alumni community. I'll be the moderator of tonight's session. And I'll just go through some quick housekeeping rules. This webinar is being recorded and may be broadcasted on ANU TV on YouTube. We encourage you to participate. So if you want to send a question to our panelists, please use the Q&A function in, on the bottom of your screen to post your questions. If you wish to speak or ask a question, uh, use the raise your hand function on Zoom and we will unmute you. Okay, attendees, cameras and microphones have been disabled on entry, but there are ways that you can interact. We can unmute you, we can put you on camera. Use the chat if you want to send comments. So questions, please send them through the Q&A. Comments, you can use the chat function. And after the panelists deliver their presentations, we will have some um, attendees to speak about their own experience here in Australia as well. So let's start with some our official proceedings. And I would like to invite Matthew Johnston from the Embassy of Australia to say a few words. Matthew is the Councillor for Education and Science at the Australian Embassy in Brazil. Uh, muito obrigado, Ana Paula. Uh, good morning and good evening, uh, alumni. Uh, thank you very much for, for joining us today for our second of the seminars that the Australian Embassy is co-hosting with the Australian National University. This year, as you all know, is a little different. In past years, we've ha held these kinds of leadership conferences face to face. We've been able to enjoy each other's company, uh, debate, even enjoy a couple of drinks in the evening. Unfortunately, uh, this, that is not possible. And I know um, everyone's had to make fairly dramatic adjustments to how we live and to your lives and how we do work. So we have uh, partnered with the Australian National University to pilot a new way of running these um, alumni leadership conferences and to contribute to your personal and professional uh, development. Uh, we hope that uh, this being the first uh, seminar will be the first of many, as I think we all acknowledge we may have to adjust our working styles and our lives for a little while yet, uh, while the virus uh, hangs around until we maybe get a vaccine. Um, so very keen to see how this works um, with the ANU. Uh, we're very pleased to partner with the ANU because um, as you will see from the uh, lineup of speakers um, that we have assembled for these seminars, they have extremely eminent uh, academics and uh, experts to share their expertise in our field. So we're very lucky to have um, this partnership. And I encourage you to participate through the Q&A function. Yesterday we had quite lively uh, discussions through the Q&A and I think it worked um, very well. So. Uh, I please encourage you to do that, and I hope you enjoy uh, these uh, these seminars. And we look forward to uh, interacting with you over uh, over Zoom, and hopefully one day in person as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Matt. And the themes of tonight's session are sustainable well-being futures, and also the importance of leadership in energy transition. And our first speaker is. Professor Robert Constanza. He's Vice Chancellor's Chair in, the pub, in Public Policy at the Crawford School of Public Policy at the ANU. And his presentation is, uh, and Bob, correct me if I got the title wrong, but it's after the 
after the crisis, building a global um, building a global consensus in sustainable well-being futures. Perfect. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, Abigado. would you introduce yourself to our audience and then uh, please feel free to start your presentation. Okay, well thanks. Thanks for that <clears throat> introduction. Um, like you said, I'm a professor at the Crawford School here, here at ANU and an ecological economist. Uh, so I try to look at the whole, the whole system of humans and the rest of nature. And I'll go ahead and start sharing my screen. And let's see. Hopefully you can see this, <clears throat> the title of the talk. Um, <clears throat> we, are in, we are in a global crisis uh, <clears throat> due to COVID-19. And it's, it's certainly horrible. Uh, and like previous global crises, you know, including World War I and World War II, um, this also presents an opportunity and an obligation uh, to rebuild our global society, to adapt to the changing conditions. Uh, the, the question is, you know, what kind of change trajectory do we want? What kind of future do we want? How can we create a sustainable well-being future? Um, <clears throat> so, and, and a big part of the reason for that is that things have changed dramatically in the world. Uh, we now live in um, what's been called the Anthropocene epoch. Uh, an era when human impacts on, on the ecological life support system are so large uh, that, that we're having a, an impact on the, the functioning of that, that system, of climate change and a whole range of other uh, ways that we're impacting uh, the, the environment. So uh, this, uh, you know, we live now in a full world and, and part of the reason that we're dealing with uh, COVID in the way we are is because of that growing interconnection and interdependence between humans and the rest of nature. Uh, this means that business as usual is no longer an option. Uh, if we really want to create this sustainable and desirable Anthropocene, uh, we need to think and act uh, differently. This is gonna take real leadership. Uh, the time is now to build an economy based on the goal of sustainable well-being of humans and the rest of nature, and recognizing uh, that we are all interconnected, humans are a part of nature, not apart from nature. And we have to understand this complex interdependent system uh, and how, how it works. Uh, rather than the goals that we have been pursuing in the post-World War II era, of just a relatively mindless pursuit of GDP growth, which has growing negative side effects on, on uh, equality and social capital and on, and on natural capital and, and ecosystem services. <clears throat> so to create this Sustainable well-being, I think we need these three elements uh, to be integrated. First of all, having an adequate vision of how the world is, our scientific understanding, and, and in a more complex, uh, interdependent way. And certainly we're learning a lot more about earth, how Earth systems function, also how, about how um, human well-being is generated. You know, the, this whole era of, uh, or area of positive psychology or, uh, is, is beginning to understand what does contribute uh, to, to human well-being. We also need to have an adequate vision of how we would like the world to be. What are our, our, what's our vision for the future? What are our goals? There's been a lot of progress in that regard as well, and I'll talk more about that. That needs to be integrated with adequate tools and analytical techniques, including uh, systems thinking and modeling. How do we look at the world more as an integrated system rather than isolated in, in independent disciplines? How do we put that all together? Uh, in order to understand this complex system. And finally, our implementation strategies, I think, are going to require new institutions and, and new kinds of strategies to help us get there. And I think uh, leadership in all of these areas is going to be increasingly important, uh, both academic leadership and political leadership and civil society leadership. Um, one effort we've been making along those lines is to change the way we look at uh, economics and the management of our world. Uh, to take a more ecological approach, one that includes uh, the rest of nature. And this approach um, has these three integrated questions or goals. Uh, first, to, to build and maintain an ecologically sustainable scale or magnitude of the human impact and presence on the, on the planet. Uh, to stay within planetary boundaries, as they've been called. Second, to have a socially fair distribution of wealth and resources, both within the current generation of humans, but also between the current generation and future generations and between humans and other species. And finally, to have an economically efficient allocation of resources 
uh, but including all of the things that contribute to human well-being, not just things that are included in market transactions, but also the non-marketed natural and social capital assets that are extremely important to, to our well-being. So sustainable well-being requires the interaction of these four basic types of assets. Um, our, our built capital, our conventional uh, kinds of capital, our human capital, individual people, but more than just their labor, their health, their education, their knowledge, uh, and our social capital, all the interactions among people, our, our networks, our institutions, our governments, our cultures, um, and finally, our natural capital, <clears throat> um, everything that we did not have to produce or, or maintain, all of the free gifts of, of nature. And those four types of assets interact uh, in a need to interact in a more balanced way to create sustainable human well-being. We've been sort of overemphasizing recently uh, our built capital uh, and uh, um, <clears throat> the marketed production and consumption as measured by GDP and underemphasizing the, uh, the effects on well-being of our natural and social and human capital. Uh, <clears throat> we estimated the relative contribution of that natural capital to our, to our uh, well-being and the ecosystem services that that natural capital produces uh, and found it to be uh, in the range of, of uh, well, significantly larger than global GDP at the time. Uh, <clears throat> one thing we didn't control in, uh, in and this was what they put on the cover of the magazine. Uh, and they said, pricing the planet. We didn't really mean pricing as much as valuing and recognizing the difference between pricing and market exchanges and value in terms of contribution to well being and particularly sustainable well being. Uh, but there are a range of ecosystem services that are not included in market transactions, include, including storm protection and, and uh, recreation services. and we listed 17 different services that were, that were worth, uh, as I said, on the average of 33 trillion a year back in 1997. Since then, <clears throat> we've estimated how those values have changed uh, since 1997 up until 2011, and found that you know over that time period, due largely to land use change, the loss of coral reefs, the loss of, of uh, tropical forests, uh, <clears throat> desertification. Uh, that we're, we've lost about $20 trillion a year in the value of those ecosystem services. Uh, we can also look into the future and, uh, and project under a range of possible scenarios what the effects of that might have on ecosystem services and find that if we take a scenario that's uh, the conventional business as usual, the market forces scenario, uh, we're looking at a continued decline in the value of those services and their contribution to well-being. If we take a policy reform or government intervention kind of uh, agenda, uh, but still with the focus on GDP, we can tend to, to moderate that, that loss and, and keep things from getting worse. But if we go to the great transition scenario, something more consistent with the UN Sustainable Development Goals, uh, we, can make, we can recover uh, and restore uh, many, many of those services going forward. So we need to change uh, how we assess progress uh, toward, toward this goal of sustainable well-being. And uh, we need to get away from uh, using GDP uh, as, a, as a limited and flawed uh, uh, estimator of that, of that progress. GDP was never designed as a measure of societal well-being. It only measures uh, market activity. And some of that activity is, is good, but some of it is, uh, is things to be avoided. Uh, so uh, there have been many attempts at alternative indicators uh, to replace GDP that take that into account. One is called the Genuine Progress Indicator, uh, which starts with personal consumption expenditures, uh, but then it weights that by income distribution, uh, recognizing the, the real impact of inequality on people's, uh, people's well-being. Uh, it adds a few things that are left out, like the value of household labor and volunteer work, very important contributions to human well-being, but not marketed and therefore not included. And it subtracts a bunch of things that should not be counted as positives. Uh, the loss of leisure time, the cost of crime, and family breakdown, the uh, air and water pollution. So uh, across these four different types of assets, um, how can we do a better indicator of what the, uh, the real net contribution to well-being of economic activity is? And that's what this GPI does. Um, <clears throat> this has been estimated for many countries around the world. Uh, not Brazil yet, as far as I know, uh, but we, um, we used all of those studies to come up with a global uh, estimate of GDP, 
of GPI, genuine progress indicator per capita, compared to GDP per capita. And you can see that while GDP per capita over this time period from 1950 to, to the 2000s uh, has been going up, uh, the GPI sort of leveled off and has been declining since about 1978 or so. So we've gone from a period of economic growth to what you might call uneconomic growth. You know, GDP, economic, market activity is increasing, but the contributions to welfare are being balanced out by the negative effects of growing inequality, of growing environmental damage, uh, et cetera. So we're not making genuine progress and haven't been for, uh, for many decades now. Uh, that's, that's really what needs to change. So if we want to create this sustainable well-being future and sustainable well-being economy, it's going to require breaking our addiction to this growth at all costs economic paradigm, to fossil fuels and to, to overconsumption. And Emma, Emma will talk more about, the, about how to transition to, um, to renewable energy, which is, which is increasingly important. But why are we, why are we still doing uh, the things that are, that are leading up leading us off the edge of the cliff. So thinking of it as an addiction, I think is one way uh, to, to understand that, that, lack of, uh, that lack of progress. Uh, we're very much addicted to, this, to the current system because of all the positive short-term uh, feedbacks uh, in a way that, that individual addicts are, are addicted to, uh, to drugs and alcohol. And we know that a key step in the therapy at the individual scale is building first a shared vision of what this uh, sustainable and desirable future uh, looks like that's focused on human well-being and, uh, <clears throat> and the rest of nature. Um, so we've done some work looking at the analogies between what works at the individual scale to overcome addictions. And there's one uh, therapy called motivational interviewing, which is one of the most effective therapies for, for treatment of substance addictions. And that's based on engaging addicts in a positive discussion of their goals and their motives and their futures as the first step in that therapy. We don't confront uh, the addict with, their, with the problem uh, that leads to denial of the, of the issue. And we're getting that sort of same kind of reaction uh, from society when, when we uh, focus so much on confronting um, <clears throat> uh, with uh, the problems of climate change and, and uh, environmental destruction and all of those things. Not that they're not true in both cases, uh, but to motivate change is going to require uh, a, a different kind of therapy that focuses first on uh, the agenda, the, the vision for the future, the goals um, uh, that for society. So how do we extend that idea by analogy to the goals for society in general? And hopefully you've all heard of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which have been agreed to by, uh, by all countries in the world, uh, including Brazil and Australia. Uh, and, and consider a much broader range of issues than simply uh, economic growth, getting rid of poverty and hunger and, and good health, you know, relevant to what's happening now, quality education, gender and general um, equality, so reducing inequalities, um, you know, sustainable cities, you've probably seen the, the list, renewable energy is a, is a key one, number seven there, uh, responsible consumption, urgent action on climate, and and dealing with uh, uh, terrestrial and marine resources, peace and justice, uh, partnerships for the goals. So all of these things are incredibly important and represent a step in the right direction for building this shared vision of what a sustainable well-being future could look like. And recognizing that these goals all interact with each other in complex ways, uh, they're all uh, at different, um, address different issues uh, of the biosphere of society and the economy in a sort of nested way. We know that um, we have to stay within uh, planetary boundaries. You've probably seen some version of this, of this discussion. Uh, and we're rapidly exceeding those planetary boundaries in a, in a biophysical sense. But we also need to create the elements of uh, sustainable well-being and quality, quality of life. We need to stay in what's been called the safe and just operating space, or the, the, the donut, as, it, as it's been called. That's, that's kind of the vision for where we need to go uh, in, the, in the future. Uh, <clears throat> leadership, I think, is going to be extremely important in this regard. And I'll just put up quickly uh, <clears throat> this proposal that was made by Franklin Roosevelt uh, during his inaugural, second inaugural address, in, or third, maybe it was, in January 1944, uh, where he was proposing a second Bill of Rights uh, that, in fact, um, <clears throat> we should all have uh, the right to useful and uh, employment, uh, to earn enough to provide adequate food, 
uh, you know, to raise and sell products, to, to, uh, uh, to trade in an atmosphere of freedom and from unfair competition and monopolies, uh, to have a decent home, uh, to achieve good health. Uh, <clears throat> so you can see reflected in this uh, many of the things that have ended up in the, uh, the sustainable development goals. And I think there is a broad global consensus um, that this range of rights um, and, and things that are required to produce this sustainable future um, are, are fairly well known. So what's missing? <clears throat> How do we make the transition? Uh, one of the things that <clears throat> sort of sealed uh, the, the vision coming out of World War II was the Bretton Woods Conference, uh, which had a different context. <clears throat> uh, what we really need now is a, a new vision uh, of what the economy is, is for. Uh, so the sustainable development goals and, and uh, versus, versus GDP growth, uh, how best to measure progress toward that goals. So we need to get beyond GDP to alternative measures of progress that can really approximate uh, well-being uh, rather than simply activity. Oops. <clears throat> um, and we need to better understand the complex then dynamics of the overall system. The context of the, Brent, the first Bretton Woods was construct, reconstruction after World War II, which certainly needed to focus on built capital and, and economic activity in the conventional sense. Uh, so the primary goal was income and GDP growth. Uh, the participants here were the victors of the, of the war. And it created a, a whole range of new institutions, including the World Bank and the IMF. Uh, and it, it focused on GDP as a measure of progress um, <clears throat> with an underlying model of the system of national accounts. Uh, the new Bretton Woods, or what we need to do now, is to recognize that the context is the Anthropocene crisis, that we need a primary policy goal of sustainable well-being, uh, that, that engages global citizens and governments, uh, and creates some new institutions, including the Well-Being Economy Alliance and uh, the uh, expansion of what the UN can do uh, with alternative measures of, of progress around the SDGs or GPI, uh, Sustainable Well-Being Index, and a different approach to understanding the dynamics of the model uh, of, the, of the economy in a more uh, that's embedded in uh, society and, and the rest of nature. So how do we take a broader vision of what, uh, what the economy really is? Uh, <clears throat> one of these initiatives is called the Wellbeing Economy Alliance, or WE ALL, which was started at a meeting in Glasgow, Scotland back in 2017 uh, with a small group of participating, uh, participating governments. Um, there's a really uh, fantastic TED talk that I encourage you to take a look at by Nicholas Sturgeon, the, um, the First Minister of Scotland, uh, about the need for a well-being economy. And this, uh, the Well-Being Economy Governments group was initiated there that included uh, Scotland, New Zealand, and, um, <clears throat> and Iceland. And that's, um, <clears throat> that's going forward uh, uh, very rapidly. Uh, one of the leaders in this movement is Jacinda Ardern, Prime Minister of New Zealand, uh, who has proposed a, a well-being budget for her country and recognized the need to address societal well-being, uh, not just the not just economic well-being. So taking these these ideas seriously, uh, Iceland has also been moving in a in a similar direction, uh, and Finland and Costa Rica and several other countries are considering joining this well-being economy um, alliance uh, as an alternative to the to the G7. Uh, we might have the WE7 or the WE20 uh, going forward uh, to really make this transition happen. You can take a look at the website for the Well-being Economy Alliance. It's down there on the on the lower right, uh, and uh, <clears throat> begin to have this discussion. How do we build back better after this crisis? Uh, what does it mean to have a, a well-being economy? Uh, what are the policies uh, that need to be that need to be implemented, and how do we build that consensus uh, of the vision that this is really where we want to go as a as a society, as a society, um, as a species? So, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor. That was. Fascinating. And um, we do have some questions, but I, I, I have a question for you, actually. I thought it was sure. um, very interesting, that comparison of this will to go back to business as usual to an addiction and that the way to deal with this deal like with an addiction, uh, showing the positives, the positive goals of getting out of it. 
why are we facing still such a push for, from so many organizations and governments to try to go back to business as usual, even though we are talking about the positives of a well-being economy? Are we that addicted or maybe aren't we talking about the positives properly? Uh, well, I think it's both of those things. Um, I think we're not having that general discussion. I think the, the challenge is how do, you, how do we bring that discussion to the general population and get people to recognize that it's not a foregone conclusion that we just go back to the things we were, we, the way things were. We can, we can uh, do things differently. Uh, so I think that's, that's the big challenge, uh, both at the policy level, but I think also at the broader societal level, because ultimately that's what's going to influence uh, policy. So I'm, I'm open for ideas for how to do that. I think it is going to take a, some sort of civil society movement. And we, can, we, we certainly see that those things can happen uh, very quickly, as, as we've seen with the Black, Black Lives Matter movement, and we've seen previously with the Occupy Wall Street movement. Uh, <clears throat> you know, but we need at least that level of engagement. Um, and so uh, <clears throat> putting out one thing we've done in Australia is to have a public opinion survey of four alter these four alternative futures uh, for the country. And we find from that survey that the vast majority of people prefer the sustainable well-being future uh, to the business as usual or the other, the other alternatives. Uh, so <clears throat> how do we build that consensus, I think, is, my, is, is the ongoing challenge. And we do have some questions from the audience here. Um, Professor, how do you see a developing country like Brazil fight hunger and social inequality while also focusing on a more sustainable economy? Do you believe that those two targets can be achieved together? And how yeah. develop, developed countries like Australia, uh, what contribution they should have on that topic? Absolutely. I think they can only be achieved together. Um, as, I, as I've said, um, we need to address the inequality issue. We need to address all of the sustainable development goals in a, in a more integrated way. And I think part of the problem is, has been the, the overfocus on GDP growth as the way to solve those problems, you know, that, that, oh, we'll just have more production and consumption and that will trickle down. You know, it doesn't work that way. Uh, <clears throat> GDP has been, the growth in GDP has been going almost exclusively to the top, you know, 1% or 0.1% really of the global population. So it's making inequality worse that's destroying our social capital, that's making it less, we're less able uh, to really address uh, many of these other issues. So we need a whole different approach to what development means. You know, development does not mean growth. Development means improvement and quality <laughs> and sustainability. And once we get past that, um, you know, and can, uh, can change our fundamental goals, you know, to well-being, as, as a few countries have started to do, then I think we can start to solve actually solve some of these problems. And there's a whole range of potential policies. If you go onto the, the, uh, the We All website or some of the other uh, publications that we've made, there's sort of a, uh, a list of what some of these policies uh, could be. All right, and just reminding, if you have uh, questions to our panelists, please just send them through the Q&A function. Um, we got another question here and it's, uh, it's quite specific and in your opinion, Professor, what will be the role of this new generation of nuclear reactors, safer and waste-free, for the transition to more sustainable energy production? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I would say that before we go down that path, that we really need to take a look at both the short and the long-term costs, the external costs of, of any sort of new, new technology. Uh, personally, I think renewable energy is, is uh, the safer and, and more sustainable way to go. Uh, but, you know, uh, any new technology needs to be looked at. But we have to remember that, you know, technology is a good servant, but a poor master. Uh, so we should not follow the technology simply because it's possible. Uh, we need to say, does that technology actually uh, help us achieve our goals that we've, that we've spent a lot of time trying to establish? And a question here about a carbon footprint tax. In a globalized world where a product is designed in a country, manufactured in another and shipped worldwide, do you think a carbon footprint tax would be useful and helpful to achieve a more sustainable future? 
Yeah, I think carbon taxes in general. <laughs> have, I mean, economists of almost every stripe and, and most others agree that that's, that would be a very effective way uh, to deal with the external costs of, of, uh, of CO2 emissions. You know, the social cost of those emissions is somewhere in the, you know, one to $200 a ton range. And so <laughs> if we begin to impose those costs on um, and internalize them, that's obviously going to uh, speed up the transition to, to renewable energy. I think even without those things, though, renewable energy is now, is now you know, cheaper than the uh, fossil alternatives. So I think the only reason that we're still pursuing uh, you know, fossil fuels uh, is, is that we're addicted. <laughs> and so uh, let's speed up the therapy. And part of the therapy is, is uh, building that shared vision of where we want to go, but the other part of it is showing that there are alternatives uh, that, that we don't need. We don't need to keep taking the drug. And um, Professor, how can uh, a lot of people in our audience today, they are managers, they are directors in some, uh, in very large organizations. How can one person uh, inside a large organization start this movement to, to, to try to focus uh, towards a well-being um, economy? when you are so entangled with the the day-to-day -day business and you have to reach your targets and the company wants profit how can you start changing that like what, what is your individual first step yeah well you're you're describing uh, uh, a manifestation of this addiction that we are so embedded in the current system that it's hard it's hard to break out and so it is going to take building this broader societal vision and and changing the changing the politics essentially uh, away from this, this focus completely on growth and, and GDP, more towards sustainability, how do businesses really run uh, with the main goal of being a, a for-benefit corporation. So this, the whole idea of B corporations, I think is a, an interesting way to go. And you set up the corporation as primarily being for the benefit of society, which is what corporations were originally uh, designed for. Uh, not simply to make money as fast as possible. It's how do, how do we create um, things that, that benefit society more, more generally. Uh, so I think there are some, uh, some things that, that, uh, that owners and, and managers of corporations uh, could certainly do. And I would, I would recommend taking a look at what the B Corporation is about and becoming a, a B Corporation. And, uh, uh, but also uh, helping in, in other ways. And I think the, the business community in general uh, is very supportive of these ideas of, of uh, building a more sustainable and desirable future. Um, I think there are <clears throat> a few bad actors in the business community, mainly the fossil fuel sector, uh, that's really uh, preventing movement, you know, as, as fast as it, as it could be happening. Turns out there's only about 90 entities in the world that are responsible for about two thirds of the carbon emissions. Uh, so <clears throat> if we begin to divest from fossil fuels, if we begin to to uh, you know, uh, hold their feet to the fire in terms of the, uh, the implications of that continued um, um, activity uh, and show that the alternatives are, are better uh, and more sustainable and, and cheaper. And I think we can speed up that transition. And, and as I said at the beginning, I think the current crisis is really an opportunity uh, to, to make that transition. This is the way things have happened in the past. Uh, you know, it, it, it almost takes a crisis sometimes to allow people to step, step back and say, do we want to keep doing things the way we've been doing? Do we want to stay in this addiction, even though we know that in the end, uh, it's not sustainable and it's not desirable. So let's take, take this opportunity. And I'm pretty sure that in our next presentation as well, uh, we are going to discuss all this, uh, the use of fossil fuels and the importance of reaching a zero carbon um, footprint. I do have one more question here that I would like to address before we go to our next presentation. Um, oh, questions are just popping up quickly now. <laughs> um, I understand Australia as well as uh, as well as other OECD members already surveyed the item life satisfaction um, mm -hmm. on their survey. It's a well-being indicator in the wage surveys. What policies are built in Australia upon results of those uh, surveys? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, the uh, and colleagues and I have been doing some some work looking at uh, the the Hilda survey. I don't know if you some of your 
listeners might be familiar, familiar with that, uh, household income and labor dynamics, uh, something, uh, where they survey life, they ask the question about life satisfaction um, and have been, you know, over, over 17 different waves. So you can look at, you know, um, how that question is answered. Uh, the question is basically, all things considered, you know, how satisfied are you with your, with your life? right now. <clears throat> Australia averages toward the top of that range compared with other with other countries. Uh, but, you know, beginning to understand well, what causes variation in that life satisfaction, it hasn't changed very much over the last several decades. Uh, <clears throat> neither have, as, as has, has uh, the genuine progress indicator. But I think it's a very important component of understanding, um, you know, well-being. Uh, how do people feel about their, their lives? Do they feel like they're they're getting their lives are getting better are they satisfied with their lives overall and if not why not and what could we do to help solve that i don't think it's the only thing we need to look at but it's it's certainly one of the other components that needs to be considered in uh, in assessing uh, well-being one of our guests is asking professor how do you see the relationship between the private and the public sector in achieving a more sustainable economy and then something that you uh, addressed a bit before, uh, how can individuals, consumers, investors, and stakeholders advocate for change in companies and government policies? Yeah. Uh, well, I think we need to get the balance right between public, private, and common property uh, resources. I think a lot of our problems these days is we're not, take, we're not managing the commons uh, very effectively, including the atmosphere, the ocean, uh, ecosystems. Uh, you know, those are, they're managed as open access resources. Anybody can, can do what they want. So there's been a lot of work on how to manage common access, common resources uh, in a more sustainable way. Um, Eleanor Ostrom was a Nobel Prize winner in economics several years ago um, and has done a lot of work on that. There's some, uh, some new work on, on uh, you know, the design principles that, that, uh, that she's developed. Uh, to help manage the commons. So they can't be left as open access. They have to be managed uh, by the community, uh, but we've been, uh, we've been advocating uh, for thinking of them as common asset trusts. So we hold them in trust for the benefit of the, of the public uh, and, and, and for future generations. Uh, so there's actually a legal principle called the public trust doctrine um, that, that sort of underlies that, that approach uh, by governments. And, uh, and maybe some of the lawyers in your, in your listeners might know something, something about that. There's a, there's a good book by Mary Wood called Nature's Trust. She's a lawyer from the University of Oregon. Um, and there's been actually some lawsuits um, you know, based on that, that principle in the US and the Netherlands and, and elsewhere. Uh, so I think that's the, the key challenge is getting property rights regimes uh, you know, uh, into a more balanced way. It's not all about privatizing or, pub or private property. That only really uh, works well uh, for, for goods and services that are rival and excludable. Uh, but for uh, ecosystem services and social capital, we need, we, need, uh, we need a different approach. We need a different um, type of property uh, regime uh, that, that can take those characteristics into, into account. Um, Peter Barnes had a book several years ago called Capitalism 3.0 that we need to, to restart, that we need to reboot our, our, uh, our system uh, <clears throat> you know, into a, a new version that uh, includes this better balance between common public and private uh, resources. Thank you so much, Professor. And we do have some more questions here, but because a lot of them involve energy, I would like first to invite our next speaker, speaker Dr. Emma Eisbett. Uh, and among other things, she is the Associate Director of Research for the ANU Grand Challenge Zero Carbon Energy for the Asia and Pacific. Um, Brazil is a country that has tradition in the use of renewable energy, and I'm sure the topic will be of interest of everyone here tonight. And um, Dr. Asbeth is going to talk about the importance of leadership in energy transition. Welcome, Doctor. Thank you very much, Anna, and good evening to everyone in Brazil. Thanks for um, joining us tonight. So I, um, I am also an economist, uh, but I also have an engineering degree, so I'm kind of interdisciplinary, but there, there's definitely um, a trend of economists to do with the environment here this evening. 
Um, let me see, have I successfully shared my screen with you? Yes, you have. Yeah. Great, okay, <laughs> good. Um, so I am, uh, as Anna said, the Associate Director of Research for what's called a grand challenge at the ANU, which um, we were funded $10 million by the ANU to take on grand challenges, global challenges that really need cross-disciplinary and also cross-sector uh, collaboration to meet. And so I'd like to talk to you today um, about the importance of leadership in achieving the vision of our grand challenge. Before I do, I would also like um, to acknowledge the Ngunnawal people, traditional custodians of the land on which I'm sitting here in Canberra, and to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. So I think um, hopefully this is an interesting topic for people in Brazil as well as for Australians, because we are both countries with very large ma land masses and quite frankly, a disproportionate share of the world's natural resources within our borders. And for that reason, we both have the potential to play much larger roles in determining the path of the global energy transition than the size of our GDPs would suggest, even though Brazil's GDP is quite big anyway. Um, in Australia, if we continue to let mining and gas interests play leadership roles in our policy making, we will continue to be an economy dependent on the extraction and export of a climate catastrophe, essentially. And that's why the ANU has stepped up and invested the $10 million in the Grand Challenge to provide thought leadership um, through collaborative research with government, industry and communities, including especially Indigenous communities. Um, so, sorry. Oh no, so, my apologies, I've um, jammed my slideshow. Um, uh, not working. I was on the wrong one. Okay, this should work. There we go. Um, so the goal of our grand challenge is to support a timely, just and sustainable transition to zero carbon energy in the Asia Pacific. And our specific objectives are to use, because we're a university, research and engagement to help transform the way Australia trades with the world by supporting development of zero carbon export energies, industries, create new paradigms in benefit sharing, particularly with Aboriginal Australians, and to develop technologies, policies and approaches that can be applied elsewhere in the Asia Pacific and beyond to the rest of the world. So why, why did the ANU decide to fund um, a grand challenge on zero carbon energy for the Asia Pacific? For one thing, um, the Asia Pacific is pivotal. So in much the way, same way as Brazil is growing very rapidly, um, the Asia Pacific has been growing rapidly for several decades. And in fact, the IEA predicts that 65% of energy demand growth in the coming decades will actually come from the Asia Pacific. So basically everyone else in the world, you know, can, can transition to zero carbon energy as fast as they want. If the Asia Pacific doesn't do it, we're all in a lot of trouble. Um, from a very sort of nationalistic perspective for Australia, that means if the Asia Pacific do decide to transition to zero carbon energy, our traditional exports can't be relied upon. So this is also about future proofing Australia's economic well-being. Thankfully, although we have a lot of fossil fuel, um, particularly coal and gas resources, we also have incredible renewable energy resources in Australia. So we have some of the best solar radiation uh, in the world, as well as a large land mass, and we also have plenty of wind. Um, so on top of that, we have human capital and we have expertise in exporting energy products. And finally, this is a little bit about the sort of triple bottom line stuff that Bob's been talking about. So not only is this a, a potential for Australia to do some real good in the world in terms of um, mitigating climate change, there's also an opportunity to grow sustainable and high quality jobs for Australians. So very much uh, as Bob was saying, sort of step one is to have a vision about um, what you want to achieve and in this much smaller topic um, we have a vision for how we can transform Australia's uh, energy exports and, and export profile in general. First what you need to understand is that what Australia does currently really does matter on a global scale. So this diagram here is showing you some um, of Australia's 
exports, in fact, our major exports. We are the world's largest exporter of coal and currently, for the last 12 months, the largest exporter of natural gas, liquefied natural gas. Both of these obviously make major contributions to climate change. Uh, we've just recently been eclipsed by China as the world's largest alumina exporter. Um, Brazil, by the way, is the third largest, exporting a bit over a third of what Australia does of um, aluminium ore. Last but certainly not least, Australia is by far the world's largest exporter of iron ore and is also our largest export earner. Brazil, by the way, is the second largest and exports about half as much as Australia. So it, it might seem strange to have these um, metal ores alongside the fossil fuel exports in this diagram for Australia, but it's important to understand that processing metal ores is an incredibly energy intensive, both extracting and processing them, incredibly energy intensive activities. Um, so the overseas processing of Australia's iron ore into iron and steel products contributes around 3% of global annual emissions, and that's actually a conservative estimate. So what is our vision then? Our vision is transform Australia from being a major exporter of embedded emissions to a major exporter of embedded renewable energy. Our calculations show that we have more than enough in terms of natural resources. We've calculated how much land would be required to produce enough renewable energy to turn all of our alumina, and our iron ore into processed metals and to produce renewable electricity and green hydrogen with the same total energy value as our current thermal coal and liquefied natural gas exports. The area of land required to do that using 50% um, solar photovoltaic and 50% wind is by, indicated by this square, um, this square here, okay? on our diagram. So that, that's a lot of land, you know, obviously it's, it's a lot of land, but Australia is a big country. And to put that put into perspective, that area is only about um, a third the amount of land currently used for dry land cropping in Australia, or about a sixth the land used for improved pasture in Australia. So it's, it's not that these sort of industries um, don't already exist that have this magnitude of impact in Australia. Of course, realising a vision like this is a major transformation for Australia's economy um, takes a lot more than confirming you have the natural resources required to do it. There are complex socio-technical and political pathways that need to be walked if we are to achieve this transformation. So our team here at ANU is contributing research to help Australia follow these pathways with confidence and success. And we're doing this through an integrated project, but also just to try and manage the task somewhat, we've divided the, the project into five um, sub-projects. And I'd like to tell you briefly about um, each of those, and in particular, the importance of leadership in each of those projects. So the first project um, that I'd like to talk about is um, the Indigenous communities leadership. So although Australia is large and sparsely populated, which means, you know, we're in a better position than some very densely populated countries in terms of having room for renewable energy production. Um, it is definitely not empty. This is not terra nullis. So the land on which the best renewable energy resources are located, particularly solar in Australia, is on the traditional land of Aboriginal peoples. And it has been their land for around 60,000 years. Despite some formal legal protections in recent decades, the outcomes for Indigenous Australians um, from mineral extraction and oil and gas extraction on their land have not tended to be very good. Um, and so what we want to make sure is that this new energy, um, energy transition is also a transformation in the way that um, Indigenous Australians get to be leaders in the development of their own land. And so our research is aimed at enabling Indigenous Australians to become leaders, to have real ownership and not just be able to perhaps negotiate um, some fair or not so fair compensation for other people um, taking control of the resources on their land. And this is absolutely crucial if we want to make sure, as, as Bob was suggesting, that we move towards a sustainable well-being or towards a sustainable development goals and not just towards um, some people's um, 
economic and, and perhaps environmental goals but coming at the expense of um, the the well-being goals of some of the most disadvantaged people in Australia. So I'm not sure if hydrogen is a thing in Brazil, but it's certainly a major topic in Australia at the moment. So hydrogen is being seen by many around the world as the future replacement for oil and gas, particularly in things like the transport industry, um, things that can't be electrified. Unfortunately, in Australia, um, as everywhere in the world, political economy matters and the dominant uh, political players are the dominant economic players in the country and that means the coal and gas industry and there are two major ways that you can make um, hydrogen one is um, through the refining of, of brown coal or of gas um, and the other is through splitting water using electricity now obviously if that electricity is coming from renewable energy then this is what's truly green hydrogen or zero carbon hydrogen but if you make hydrogen from um, coal or gas, you have a lot of emissions um, that may or may not be um, particularly well captured and, and stored through carbon capture and storage at the end of that. And so if you, if you think about countries like Japan who are wanting to transition away from a dependence on, on, on liquefied natural gas um, towards sort of zero emission fuels like hydrogen within their economy and thereby make their um, commitments to global climate um, agreements, that's not going to achieve very much if in the process of making that hydrogen, we've actually used fossil fuels back in Australia, particularly because you emit three times as much carbon in making hydrogen from a fossil fuel and then burning it in Japan as you would if you just sent the hydrocarbon directly to Japan in the first place. So it's really imperative that um, there is leadership from the community, from researchers and from government, quite frankly, to say, no, we're not going to let hydrogen be, um, you know, created without um, a cost being paid for the implicit emissions from those. And so we really, there's quite a, a um, discussion brewing in Australia at the moment about what the definition of, of low carbon or clean hydrogen is and how this new industry should or not should or should not be supported by government. So leadership obviously in terms of policy, in terms of um, social well-being um, is important but technology leadership is also important. There's currently a global race to see which countries will be the leaders in these new green industries that are emerging. And if Australia does not invest in technology leadership, we will remain a supplier of raw materials to the West, rest of the world and miss the opportunity to value add and create high quality jobs. And I know this is not, there's many countries in the global south um, other than Australia that face this same challenge of how do you make sure that you somehow get to or stay at the technology frontiers so that you can create the really top quality jobs. And so part of our research is supporting the actual technological development in, in the areas where the technology still needs to be developed, particularly to get it to an efficient scale. And that is definitely the case um, with the refining of iron ores. So while um, photovoltaics and wind turbines, they're all, there's, they're incredibly well researched for many decades now. They are, as um, Professor Costanza said, cheaper actually than coal as a form of electricity generation. So the, the real focus of our research in that area is not on, on the technology side of things. But when it comes to these really new industries, um, like how do you actually refine iron ore without using coal? Um, that is a technical challenge to which we're also contributing. As I said, 100% renewable electricity systems and indeed renewable energy systems are technically possible and need not be exorbitantly expensive. However, uh, renewable energy production is intermittent when the sun's not shining or the wind isn't blowing, that energy is not as available. So we need ways of storing and of sharing um, the load around for example, um, if you connect across a large geographical area, 
uh, your electricity system, then when the sun is not shining in one place, it, there's a good chance it will be shining in another or the wind will be blowing in another. And by having this sort of connectivity, you actually decrease the need to have large and potentially expensive storage. And you also decrease the need to do something like use gas um, firing to, to sort of top up. And so one of the things that we're looking at in our grand challenge is in fact, um, how do we how do we get leadership, um, how do we get these systems to be connected over geographical areas, not only across Australia, but potentially across um, connecting Australia to the Asia Pacific. And then you have absolutely massive potential gains, not only because some countries um, will have a comparative advantage and therefore be able to produce cheap, clean electricity for other for other places. And Northern China with all its wind is one example. Australia with all its sun is another example. Um, but also because you get this sort of um, equaling out effect um, from, from the geographic diversity. But none of this happens very easily. And there's obviously um, a big need for leadership to, to make these grids connect, and particularly in the current global um, climate uh, of, of in sadly increasingly nationalistic climate. So um, to conclude, <laughs> the scientists and engineers have done a great job over the last decades. Renewable energy is now cheaper than new build fossil fuel energy. It's time for the leaders in our community, in research, in government and in industry to step up and do their part and let the rest of us take advantage of this incredible resource um, that we have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doctor. That was, yes, that was very interesting as well. And we did have uh, questions coming while you were presenting. One, uh, one of the questions was actually about the cost of the grids. And I believe you addressed it saying, talking about the interconnection of grids between different countries and expanding its area. Um, and also when you mentioned uh, the, the need to, uh, of support for those projects, the, the political support, we had someone that asked, oh, do you have support from the prime minister to this project? <laughs> well, actually, um, the minister for energy, um, Angus Taylor, actually um, gave a speech opening our launch at Parliament House um, last year. So I think, I think that really speaks to the fact that if you have a vision that, you know, of the sort that Bob was talking about, where like there are just wins for everyone that, that is a really powerful way of moving beyond our addictions. So, so um, I, I won't say that it's an easy political situation in Australia currently, um, but, um, but we are seeing some progress. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, we do have a question here addressing as well uh, the suggestion that the renewable energy sector has uh, uh, has a sophisticated conspiracy to earn large profits from the energy transition. Uh, it was actually addressed in the in the documentary by Michael Moore, Planet of Humans. What do you think about that? So I have to admit I haven't watched the Michael Moore um, documentary, but I can say that um, yes, there are players in the renewable energy industry that hope to make money. And isn't that the way it's supposed to be? I don't understand. Um, why, why, why you're not allowed to make money doing something that's good for the world? So, um, I look quite frankly, the the renewable energy industry in Australia has been growing at enormous rate without the need for subsidies because we have these incredible um, solar and wind resources, and the technology is that cheap. Largely thanks, I will admit, to subsidies that the Germans put in over many decades into the development, to the economies of scale that the Chinese solar manufacturers have achieved. Um, so, so yeah, this is an industry that I hope will become profitable at the same time as doing something good for the world. Mm -hmm. And a question about the hydrogen energy life cycle. How long does it take to offset the equivalent CO2 emitted to make it zero carbon? So um, it depends on how you make the hydrogen. So if you make hydrogen by um, taking water and splitting it into hydrogen and oxygen using 100% um, renewable energy, 
then there are essentially, um, it's, it's zero carbon hydrogen right from the start. Um, if you make hydrogen by methane gas reforming, um, you have a lot of carbon emissions. So you have, um, for example, um, leakage emissions at the time you're extracting the gas from the ground, there's always fugitive emissions that you can't sort of capture and store. And methane, of course, is a very powerful greenhouse gas. Then you have the actual carbon emissions from when you take that gas and you, you essentially split off the carbon, combine it with oxygen to get the remaining hydrogen out of the gas. Um, those can theoretically um, be captured, um, those carbon dioxide emissions and, and stored or put underground. Um, however, in reality, there are not many very successful um, carbon capture and storage um, facilities in the world, and especially long term. So how long can you really keep that carbon in the ground? Um, so, so certainly, um, in our view, um, the, if you really are trying to achieve um, climate mitigation, then you really want to be just going straight to making um, green hydrogen by splitting water with renewable energy. Mm -hmm. And I would like your view on this uh, comment we received here from one of our guests as well. How do you think that we should communicate to not motivate the use of energy by saying that renewable energy is the better way? We all know that there is no 100% renewable energy available. So it depends where you are. Um, so we are sitting here in the ACT in Canberra and um, we actually have 100% renewable electricity um, in Canberra. And so I have an electric car <laughs> um, and we also just um, had our gas heating system a couple of weeks ago um, turned over to be a heat pump and now runs on that same 100% um, renewable electricity so it is possible it's certainly possible in Australia it's actually possible everywhere if you look um, carefully enough there is there is plenty of sunlight and plenty of wind to go around um, having said that there might be zero carbon energy but you know everything does have an environmental cost right I mean you saw the size of that square that we're talking about that would be required to transform all, all of our current sort of polluting exports um, and, you know, there are environmental consequences to, to that as well. So I definitely agree that, um, you know, insofar as we can serve and have a win-win, um, that, that that is the way to go. I think Bob was raising his finger. Yeah, just to add to, add to that, um, <clears throat> I think uh, the, the problem is, um, again, back to this focus on, on GDP growth, that we can have renewable energy uh, that can maintain and sustain a, a well-being economy. Uh, I'm not sure we can have renewable energy that will that will power you know, infinite growth in the conventional sense. And I think that was that was kind of the problem with the Planet of the Apes movie as well. I think they were making two conflicting points. Uh, you know, that that first point is that a big part of our problem is this over focus on on GDP and and the, the ignoring the inequality implications of that and the environmental uh, destruction implications of that. Uh, but that doesn't mean that renewable energy can't be the, the source of our uh, sustained, sustained well-being. So we have to sort of do both. I don't think it's, it's going to power infinite growth, but we don't want infinite growth. <laughs> we want, we want uh, sustainable uh, development. And I think that, that point doesn't come across well enough. I think there's a, lot, a large segment of even the renewable energy sector that's saying, oh, well, this is just gonna replace fossil fuels and keep the economies growing in the same old way. Uh, we'll just substitute renewables for fossil fuels. But I think it's gonna be a, a more complex transition that we need. We have a question here asking if there is any national program or maybe international program to accelerate the energy transition to renewable electricity in isolated communities or islands. And if there is, what type of renewable energy is more appropriate for that type of community? Australia is an island. <laughs> that, that's, a, <laughs> that's an excellent question. Um, so I know there are, there are definitely programs, um, both research programs and aid supported programs from many governments around the world um, for remote and small island um, 
renewable energy systems. And in fact, for exactly these communities, communities that have traditionally either had no power or relied on incredibly expensive and noisy and polluting diesel generators, um, a, a microgrid based on solar and or wind um, is actually an incredibly efficient way. And so these are the ideal communities to actually leapfrog straight, skip, skip the sort of fossil fuel generation and go straight to renewables. And before I ask one of our attendees to participate, we will have uh, some guests from the audience. I would like to pose this last question for both of you. Um, could we say that if people were more adapted to advocating for their own well-being, it would be easier to deal with pandemic situations? Yeah, probably. <laughs> um, I, but I think it's not something that individuals can do individually, I think it is a social issue. I mean, we have the public health services and, and I think if we had a, a stronger focus on well-being in general, uh, <clears throat> our public health systems would be better. Our, <clears throat> our, um, uh, and, and in fact, you see that in the differences around the world and how countries have dealt with uh, this crisis. And it turns out that the countries that are led by females are the ones that have been doing the best in, in this regard. Uh, including New Zealand. Australia is not doing badly, but, but uh, New Zealand and, and uh, Iceland and, and et cetera, all of those countries <clears throat> have, have taken a much more uh, <clears throat> uh, reasoned and scientific approach and, and have said, you know, yeah, yes, we need to deal with the health of the population first and <clears throat> you know, recognize that, that the economy and GDP is a means to that end. It's not, it's not the goal in itself. Whereas other countries have taken, like the US have taken the opposite approach, at least at the federal level uh, and said, you know, we really just got to get back people back to work and, you know, don't worry about it. But it's, it's both individuals, people recognizing that, that their health is, is a key factor and also the, the culture and the society and, um, internalizing that. So Come thinking on. about me, but also remember we have, it to, we have to think about we. <laughs> Yeah, yeah good. I, I agree, but I also think that was an excellent question from the panelists that um, unfortunately we are becoming perhaps less and less connected and less and less good at actually understanding the determinants of our own well-being. I think that's a really good point that only, you know, if you kind of um, just sit in front of a screen all day and, and, and they're addicted to sugar, um, you're not even understanding how to take care of your own well-being. So how can you help take care of the society and the world? So I think that's a really good point. That's true. Um, I would like now to invite one of uh, our attendees to participate in our panel today. Her name is Bruna Batista and she has been to the University of Queensland and she's going to talk to us today about sustainable agro, um, agro, agro ecosystems. So um, Bruna, welcome to our event. It's lovely to see you here. Hi, Anna. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Good to see you, Bruna. How are you? Good, thank you. Just so, a minute. I need to, to make... Okay, yes. <laughs> if you could share a little bit of your experience with us for two or three minutes. Yeah, sure. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me here today, Anna and Matthew. It's a pleasure to share a little bit of my experience as an Australian alumni. Uh, my name is Bruna, I'm a biotechnologist and I have a PhD in microbial genetics from the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. I work with plant-associated microorganisms aiming to reduce the environmental impacts of the application of chemicals to crops. Manipulating these microbiomes is considered to be a key for a new and sustainable green revolution. My link with Australia started in 2016 when I, I was awarded a PhD exchange fellowship by the Australian Academy of Science. I spent two months at the University of Queensland working with herbicide degrading bacteria to be used at the Great Barrier Reef. To be honest, I couldn't do much in these two months there from the research point of view. However, this experience allowed me to build a strong relationship with the research group at UQ which I think it was the main purpose of the, the program. 
So I went back to Brazil, finished my PhD, and then I worked for one year at a company, BASF, screening biological products for agriculture. Fortunately, I returned to Australia in 2018 as a visiting postdoc with an Endeavor Fellowship to work in the same research group at UQ. My research, my project this time involved understanding the language spoken between soil microbes and nutrient deficient plants. I could detect that plants under stress cry for help, releasing signals through their roots that attract specific microbes, which will help the plant to overcome the stress. My experience at, at UQ was great. I worked in a very diverse group and I learned a lot. This is when I realized that I wanted to stay here in, in Australia. The, ma the main reason was that Australian universities work closely with companies. So there's a larger chance that your research will be applied to the real world. After the Endeavor program, I got a position at Western Sydney University at the Hawkesbury Institute for the Environment. And here I work with the development of biological products to control diseases in Australian cotton. I'm sure that my previous experience in Australia made all the difference to be selected for this position, mainly because of the links I created with people who could recommend me here. Uh, another point I, uh, it's worth mentioning is that as an immigrant, many companies will not hire you here in Australia because they are unwilling or unable to spons sponsor your visa. So if you're looking for positions in Australia, not now, but after the, the, the pandemic, it's important to focus on organizations which have experienced hiring international employees, such as the, the universe. Uh, yeah, I think that's it. I would like to thank the Embassy of Australia in Brazil for all the guidance during the whole process. And I also wish you all good luck in your future endeavors. Thank you so much, Bruna. And it's lovely to see you again after yeah. we met in the Academy of Science a few yes, years ago. Yes. In 2016, yeah. <laughs> yes, and I'm so glad to, uh, to hear about your experience. And yes, there are ups and downs, I believe, in, in the experience of, of everyone um, here in Australia. L Australian born, Australian by choice. Yes, <laughs> yes. But it is, it is an incredible journey and I'm so, I'm so happy that you were able to continue your research. Yeah, thank you. I would like to invite another attendee to participate as well. Um, if I could have Associate Professor Vasiliki Bolomitis to join us and talk a little bit uh, about the experience in the use of small scale hydro plants and uh, for lower environmental impact. Good morning. Um, hi, good morning there. Thank you very much for the opportunity of sharing a little bit of my experience. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right, great. Well, my name is Vasiliki and I went to Australia in 2016 until the beginning of 2018. It was for a PhD program under a co-tutel agreement with the State University of Campinas and uh, in Australia with Swinburne University of Technology. Um, it was an amazing opportunity for me and also for my family because uh, everybody was there with me and I could learn a lot uh, with the uh, way that the universities are in Australia because they're quite different from the way that universities are here, especially concerning what Bruna said, because in Australia, um, one of the main things is that the universities are connected to the industry and in Brazil it's nothing um, that happens so easily. We have these kinds of programs but uh, not usually. Uh, they're not so frequent the way that they happen in Australia. Well I came back to Brazil and I already had a position as a lecturer now um, when I finished my PhD so I became a professor and I continue working at the same institution for the civil engineering program. And uh, my PhD was with uh, modeling uh, floods in a Brazilian area. Uh, the problem is that this area was not monitored. It was not assessed. So we had to deal with a lot of 
mathematical, numerical computer modeling to estimate data that we didn't have in order to run different models and uh, achieve uh, the patterns of this uh, specific watershed in different scenarios. Uh, today, I'd like to just bring, um, it's not actually the experience I had in Australia or in my PhD, but it's something that I'm starting to work with my students which is uh, to explore a, bit, a little bit the potentiality of making uh, low hydro plants, because in Brazil we have a lot of problems with uh, loss, energy loss, due to the huge network of distribution. So if we combine this potentiality of low uh, scale hydro plants, with uh, windmills and solar panels, photovoltaic energy, uh, we could uh, explore much more and have a huge gain for uh, local communities instead of bringing energy from uh, distant plants and having this uh, impressive loss the way we have here. And also the cost of it would be uh, much more attractive and beneficial for the population. Um, something that I would like to uh, tell you about the two lectures is that um, uh, I personally enjoyed uh, a lot both of them and uh, the experience I brought from Australia was exactly to admire the well-being of our personal well-being because I had much less than I have here in Brazil. And uh, I felt a lot happier because of the quality of life we had there. We didn't have such a huge social discrepancy. We could uh, uh, go downtown uh, without traffic. Uh, the air was clean. So all this brings us the feeling that our lives um, uh, are have much more quality instead of living in a packed place with all the pollution, uh, poverty, and uh, also dangerous neighborhoods where we cannot walk at night. And uh, I think this is the best about Australia, and I wish we could have that uh, in Brazil. And something about the second lecture that I heard was also about the consideration they are having towards the Aboriginal people when thinking about uh, developing uh, new structures, new plants for exploring renewable sources of energy. Uh, this is something that uh, made me feel very emotional because it's, it's what we do not have at the moment in Brazil. People are not considering uh, our indigenous that have been here for such a long time. It's there, it's actually their land and people are not really considering it. So congratulations for the researchers uh, for making this amazing work and thank you so much for the um, time you gave me to share a little bit of my experience in Australia. Thank you so much, Vasiliki. And I, and I think it is uh, really obvious that economic growth, it's not all about economic growth. There are a lot of other aspects that have to be considered. Thank you so much for participating today. And um, if our attendees have any more questions for our panelists, please send them through the Q&A. We are about to finish our, um, our seminar tonight. And I'm very happy to have heard from our attendees today as well, because I am myself an alumni from Australia. I am originally from Florianopolis in the south of Brazil. And I came to Australia to study a master's degree at ANU. The experience and knowledge as, um, that I acquired in this Australian journey allowed me to work at the Brazilian Embassy for some time, where I recognize a lot of the names here today. And it's just heartwarming to see, to, to recognize people. And now I'm back to the university where it all started. And yeah, so I have to thank the Australian National University as well for the opportunity to be here. 
at the ANU, we do have a team dedicated uh, to engagement with Brazil. If you would like to know more about the relationship between the Australian National University and Brazil, don't hesitate to contact one of today's co-hosts, Daniel Brown. He just appeared in your screen here. Say hello, Danny. You can unmute yourself. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining and thank you so much uh, to our panelists tonight. And Anna Paula, beautiful job moderate, moderating. Emma, Robert, we really appreciate um, your commitment to what you're doing and, um, and uh, for, for your willingness to share with our uh, alumni in Brazil. Thank you. Thank you so much. If you have any questions about the relationship between Brazil and Australia, contact Danny Brown. He is our specialist in that. If you have any questions about how to study or how to apply to ANU, you can contact me. I'm happy to help with that. And um, this, uh, this presentation has been recorded. And I would like to thank you so much, Dr. Eisbert, uh, Professor Constanza. Your presentations were fantastic. And tomorrow we will be here at the same time with another lineup of specialists and we will dis be discussing leadership in driving um, economic reform. Mm -hmm. So thanks for joining us today and até amanhã. Boa noite. Muito obrigada. Hi everyone, thanks for listening. Thanks so much.